Hey, listeners, it's Dan here. I want to tell you about a company that I'm really excited about. It's called Current. It's a fintech company that's completely disrupting traditional banking. I'm a new Current customer. It's already helping me and my entire family manage our finances, all from one easy-to-use app. So try Current for yourself and get the app by going to current.com slash OK. That's current.com slash OK. Current is a financial technology company, not a bank. Banking services provided by and Visa debit card issued by Choice Financial Group, member FDIC, pursuant to a license from Visa USA, Inc., and can be used everywhere Visa debit cards are accepted. All right, you're listening to OK Computer. I'm Dan Nathan. I am joined by my co-host, Rick Heitzman. Hey, Rick. How are you, man? I'm doing all right. This is kind of like an emergency pod here, Rick. We like to cover tech, both public and private markets. Public markets seem to be a little bit in turmoil over the last few weeks or so. So we had to bring a very special guy in, my co-host, from on the tape, Guy Adami. How are you, Guy Adami? I'm great. And you brought me in just at nap time. Get to be my age, you have to do those afternoon naps. So I'm thrilled to be here at OK Computer. Well, Guy, this is not our OK Boomer segment just yet. We were going to do that with him when we really wanted to bring in our resident Luddite to explain something about tech. But we brought you in to help us think about what's going on as far as the markets as it relates to tech. But here's the deal. Later, Rick and I are going to be joined by Jared Dicker of the Churning Group, Sally Shin of United Masters, and our good friend and former on-the-tape guest, Mikel Jolet. He is the front man of the rock band, Airborne Toxic Event. We're going to talk about all things Web3 and music. That's going to be a whole heck of a lot of fun. We're also going to cover the Spotify brouhaha with Mikel. But first, guys, we got to talk about what's going on in markets here. It's been a really, really difficult January, Guy. Talk to me a little bit about when's the last time that you remember we saw a NASDAQ down 10% for the month of January to start the year out? Can't remember in January, but last time we had moves of this significance outside of March, April of last year, probably the fall into December of 2018. And you say this all the time, Dan, the higher things go towards the end of the year, the faster and the more precipitous the drop early in the ensuing year. And that's exactly what we saw here in January. I happen to think, by the way, it's essential. And I actually think it's probably the healthiest thing that could have happened if you want to remain bullish for the back half of 2022. Rick, is this bizarre to you that your friends in public markets obsess so much over quarter by quarter, month by month, year over year? You're obviously a venture capitalist and you think about things in much longer time horizons. We're going to talk about that a little bit. But like, for instance, the Nasdaq is down 9% on the year right now, down 12% from its highs, which were made in November. So it never confirmed any of the new highs in the S&P 500 for the entire month of December and early January. And at its lows last week, it was down near 18% from those all-time highs. Guy and I talked a lot about it on Fast Money. We talked about it on the tape last week. Microsoft and Apple, which are nearly $5 trillion in market cap, they did what they needed to do on the earnings front. They both reported their calendar Q4, and that put a bottom into the market near term. I'm just curious, what are your thoughts when you're out there doing the stuff that you're doing? You're looking at new deals. You're <laughs> handing out term sheets. When you see a NASDAQ that's down nearly 20% in a month, what does that mean to you? Yeah, you can't help but to see it. You can't help but to think about it. Living in New York City, you can't help running in friends like you guys who, not day to day, but hour to hour on if your screen is green or red, and therefore it's constantly in your face. You go into an elevator, it's on Captivate TV, the sky's falling. So you have to be aware of those surroundings. But at the same time, as we think about it, and we go from the elevator into our boardroom and have our team meeting, we still try to think in decade-long arc. We've benefited tremendously from what we have called the longest view in the room. People will stress out. People will think about things in the short term and tend to overreact in the short term. In a business like ours, where we're long-only holders for multiple years, so there's nothing we could do about it. We could lose sleep, but that probably doesn't help anybody. And therefore, what are we going to do? Not that much. We continue to believe that a lot of the trends here are mega trends, and we'll see innovation continue to drive, and we'll see digitization continue to disrupt almost every industry. Well, it's interesting you mentioned innovation and digitization. 
Think about this. We just said that Microsoft and Apple put a near-term floor last week with their results. By the time that a listener is listening to this podcast, we will have Alphabet's earnings. They're reporting Tuesday after the close. Wednesday after the close is Facebook. And then Amazon, which is Thursday after the close. And when you think about it, is there a whole heck of a lot of innovation going on in those trillion-dollar-plus sort of names? Not really, but they own digitization right here. And that's why we spend so much time talking about them in public markets. Those five stocks made up about 25% of the weight of the S&P 500, an index, again, guy, you can do that math, of 500 stocks. And they made up 35, 40% of the NASDAQ 100 here. And so, guy, if Google and Facebook and Amazon don't have disastrous guidance this week, do you think the floor is in for the NASDAQ? Because we took out a whole heck of a lot of speculation in a very short period of time. I think it's just going to slow the eventual decline. I still think there's another leg lower. To your point, if you get decent numbers, by the way, decent right now has to be better than just in line, I think, for both of the companies you you just mentioned. But let's just say we get that. I think we're going to still have this move to the downside. I just don't think we'll accelerate as quickly as it probably would have. I'll say this as well, and you can do this, Dan, because you did a great show called Options Action for years on CNBC. But over the weekend, I read that it's been a lot of put protection bought over the last couple of weeks, and that's going to prove to be a little bit of a speed bump on the way down. So that move, that accelerated move that we saw, obviously, a couple of weeks ago, I don't think you're going to see moves of that magnitude or of that speed, but I still think there's a leg lower here, regardless of what those behemoths report. Hey, Rick, do you think it's a weird obsession that your public market friends or even a lot of people who are just investors or traders in the public markets have with those five names? Throw Tesla in there. You got six. Is it just odd to you because you spend a lot of time in the weeds looking for the next founders, the next companies that are actually going to disrupt those companies? And I know that sounds crazy to think about because these are all companies that have, for the most part, over $100 billion in sales. So you're thinking about that company that's going to be getting to $100 million dollars in sales and then start to ricochet. And there's even a middle class here. The middle class has been ripped up even more of call it public companies between a billion and $20 billion market caps in tech, which were trading at generally very high multiples who've gotten destroyed. So if you think about the fangs providing a ballast in the public markets and such a huge part of the index is they were able to support a lot of these companies that went from a $7 billion market cap to a $3 billion market cap in the last 90 days. And as we think about exits, it'd be great if we're investing in the next Facebook or Amazon. But most of the way we think about exits are companies are going to go public at a market cap between, call it, 2 and $10 billion. And if those companies are getting hurt, that disproportionately hurts us more than an Amazon or a Google. We didn't talk about it last time you were on. Microsoft made that $70 billion cash bid for Activision. We saw Take-Two make a deal for Zynga, a much smaller deal. And then there was another deal, Sony, I think Bungie, right, in this space. So it just seems like there's an M&A frenzy going on regardless of what's going on in the public markets. It seems like there's certain very hot properties. I'm just curious, are you happy to see this sort of M&A? What does that mean for your portfolio in general right now? We're happy to see this part of M&A. We've been deep in gaming for a long time. If you think about media time spent, gaming has taken a tremendous amount of media time spent over the last 20 years and has largely gone ignored by the public markets. There haven't been that many public market plays. There haven't been that many multi-billion dollar exits. But we look at it as beers in the fridge. There was only three large beers in the fridge, and that's Electronic Arts, and Activision and Take-Two. And then there's a couple other multi-billion dollar plays. And we thought that when those start getting acquired, there's not another name behind them. So that would trigger a frenzy of consolidation between tech and media. So obviously Activision's the first one to go. Bungie was a studio at scale with Destiny and a lot of premium titles that somebody was going to buy for multi-billion dollars. Take-Two bought Zynga, but doesn't mean they're out of the woods yet in terms of being an acquisition target versus being a large public company. And obviously, Electronic Arts has been kicked around and probably been speculated with selling to Disney ever since Disney bought ESPN 25 years ago. Yeah, Guy is more of a white clog in the fridge there. But Guy, are there any pockets within tech that you think of the public markets that are ripe for M&A? White claw. I have never had a white claw. I have seen them in my kid's refrigerator at school. Right for M&A. You know, I'm with Rick on this one. We've talked about this for seemingly years on Fast Money that 
I was surprised that EA hasn't gone to a Disney or to an Apple. You wonder for some of these companies with the cash word they have for Microsoft, $70 billion deal. I mean, that's a rounding error for them if you think about it in the context of how big they are. So you can afford to take bets like this. As opposed to, by the way, what we saw earlier this week, since I'm the boomer in the group, look at what AT&T just had to do. Think about the mistakes they've made, and now they're having to pay for those mistakes, whereas some of these companies have gotten themselves in a position where, regardless of whether or not they're successful, they're not going to have to pay for it because, again, they put themselves in a position of strength, not weakness. I would also throw Amazon into the mix of they own Twitch, they're interested in gaming, to own either a studio that produces content that would pair with Amazon Studios after buying MGM, they could be a buyer of scale. So Facebook has been in and out of games. So you got to think about all the players who'd be interested in this next generation, fastest growing sector of media. There's not that many names out there. And obviously the premium ones are EA and Take Two. Yeah, but Rick, do you think that the behemoths are so big right now that this might be very different than past cycles where some of these tier two players may just have to merge, maybe mergers of equals rather than media company and a telco or some of the things that we've seen in the past, like Guy just mentioned with AT&T and Time Warner. But what about, and we talked about this a little bit on the, on the tape on Friday, what about Twitter and a snap, a merger of equals there? We know that we've seen activists in Twitter in the past and maybe snap, which is down 60 some percent or so, maybe Evan speaks. Eagle is the guy to push those two advertising businesses together and better compete with some of the behemoths. I mean, that makes sense to me. Obviously, you're not going to comment on Pinterest and PayPal. That was a deal that was thought to be in the mix a few months ago. But there's a lot of interesting combinations if these companies are going to go at it alone and really try to reach this sort of scale. And the scale that we're talking about is getting to a billion plus users, right? Exactly. And it's also a scale in leadership. Twitter just changed leadership. But if you look across the last generation of media and content companies that are digital, Evan Spiegel has clearly out-executed everybody on the product side, on the engagement side. Twitter has underperformed on the product and engagement side. Twitter spaces aside, there hasn't been much innovation there. So if you have somebody forward-thinking like Evan running both of those product teams, there's probably synergies besides on the advertising sales side. No doubt. Here's one for the road here, guys. I think Netflix had that huge gap. And then Pershing Square's Ackman came in, took a 3 million share position. He's an activist, but he might not be activist. I mean, how can you be an activist with Reed Hastings at the helm? But here's one. I think Spotify, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later with Mikkel, I think that Netflix, they've already said they're going to get into gaming. The idea of broadening out horizontally and taking on a streaming platform with music and podcasts makes a whole heck of a lot of sense to me. If I was Bill Ackman, I'd be kind of agitating for that sort of activity. That would be the easiest way to get that stock back up to the highs, in my opinion. You were probably watching my old tape on Fast Money the day that Spotify went public. A week before they went public doing this crazy direct listing thing, I thought that Netflix shouldn't have let them get public. I think if someone's going to pay for subscription services and someone's going to pay for unique and original content, that content can only be video. And they can't only pull in from their creators and creators around the world. They have to be able to pull in textual, audio, video content. And obviously, Spotify is growing tremendously and has scale. Because a lot of the other smaller, we talked about subscale media and content players, that doesn't affect Netflix. That doesn't move the needle. Spotify moves the needle. And I think that would make a tremendous amount of sense for everybody involved. Here's one for you, Guy. You just said you don't think that the stock market sell-off in tech stocks is over. I was looking at my screens today, and I really think that some of the bounces that we've seen are really anemic. And I think to a lot of people who don't stare at screens all day long like we do, they're a little bit jaded when you see such a sharp move off the lows. Here's a good example. So Zoom is up 13% in the last week. That sounds huge, right? A $45 billion market cap, it just gained, what, $5 billion in market cap. But here's the problem. It was down 77% from its all-time highs in 2020. Now, you can do the math if you want to calculate, Guy, 77% on that number at its lows. So this is like a rounding error. It looks like nothing on the chart. Snap, it's up about 20% in the last week. It's still down about 60% from its all-time highs it just made a few months ago. $53 billion market cap, trades at about 10 times sales. The last one here, Roku, it's up about 17% in the last week or so. It's still down 66%. Now, listener, here's the deal. 
deal. Go to your Yahoo Finance. Put those tickers in there right there, and you're going to see the move over the last week or so looks like a blip. So, guy, if they fail here and they can't really gain a head of steam and they go back towards those lows, things are going to get ugly in the NASDAQ, huh? That's what I think, Dan. And throw a snowflake in there, by the way, which is not a small company. I mean, even with the move from 390, I think, a couple months ago, down to 250 in the subsequent bounce, still an $80 billion company. So, yes, if you look at these bounces just in a vacuum, you're like, oh, my God, look at these rallies in these stocks. But in the context of where they've been, it's not all that impressive. So what do I think? I think this is a counter trend rally. I've said a number of times, and I'll throw this out there. The mantra of don't fight the Fed is true and something that makes me scream because it's so simplistic. But you know what? It does hold some weight. If it's true when the Fed is adding liquidity and by fighting the Fed, you're being bearish, then when the Fed is taking it away, if you're bullish, you're effectively doing the same thing. You're fighting the Fed. And I think people don't fully realize this paradigm shift that we're in the midst of. Yeah, but to that point, guy, you just mentioned Snowflake. Listen, Rick, I know people like you who invest in innovation and you're looking for these businesses to get to scale. This is an $85 billion company. It's down 30%, was down more. I think at its lows, it was down about 43%. Expected to have $2 billion in sales. It trades at 40 times sales. How do you justify that? That's the key measure. I think people got away from traditional valuation metrics. The SaaS world started to trade in excess of 20 times sales. And especially when you see rising interest rates and therefore your risk-free rate and your cost of capital is increasing, what has to happen between now and then for these guys to eventually trade off cash flow or earnings as all companies do? It's a long way to do that at a very expensive capital. So I think you're going to see a lot of the folks that got punished were trading at the highest multiples and they're coming back to earth. I think now SaaS stocks are trading at historical ranges of around 10. I think you're seeing emergent media trade around 10. You mentioned snaps trading around 10 times revenue. That's kind of where things were historically. And whether additional Fed action means that there's a lot more that's going to be pulled out of the system, therefore a lot of air pulled out of that bubble and multiples increasingly deflating, I think that's the key thing in that should stocks trade at 10 times, let alone 40 times, and let's figure out what the new world looks like, it's not irrational to say that stocks should trade at multiples of projected earnings and not of revenue, regardless of business model. Guy and I have been saying this for years. Just as things overshoot to the upside, they do so to the downside. And so Zoom on the way up at 10 times sales seemed expensive until the pandemic happened. And then it got much more egregious. And now it's back at 10 times sales. And it's not likely to bottom there. That's just my personal opinion. All right, real quickly here before we get to Mikkel. There was a really interesting op-ed, Rick, in the information by Vinod Kosla. He is a storied venture capitalist. The name of the article was Stop Asking Me About the Markets. Okay, we just talked about the markets for a good bit. But he said, we in venture capital offer often get asked, how is the market cycle affecting your investing? His answer, public market hedge fund investors evaluate themselves every quarter. We just talked about that. Venture funds might have to wait as long as 10 years to assess how their investments performed. He said, this is extremely difficult here, likely impossible questions to answer. So why try? Real quickly, will you try? How is this affecting your business? Do you think VC is going to have a bumpy year in 2022? It's going to have a bumpy year. And as we've talked about in prior pods, it's going to be a year of discrimination where the wheat's going to be separated from the chaff, good companies from the bad. And as much as you could say, hey, we play the long game, we have decade long positions and a lot of our best positions have been over a decade long. You can't help but to look around. And you can't help but to look around and maybe not on a even a quarterly basis if you're a hedge fund on a minutely or hourly basis. And how do you think about how your P&L is looking that day? It also forces feedback cycles. So public market investors are getting very quick feedback on these adjustments from the market. Some venture capitalists really only think about their marks on a quarterly basis. So a lot of folks are living in the still frothy, generally, times of the fourth quarter of 2021. And now we're moving into 2022. The market's adjusted and no one's had to mark to market. Well, I think when people do mark to market, they realize it's not that easy. And I think the IPO pathway is not that easy. I think the multiples for M&A aren't going to be that easy. And whether or not we want to have decades-long perspectives, we're all human. And therefore, we think about exits as a barometer of success and therefore our desire to put capital out, and that'll adjust. And I think we're starting to hear a little bit in the venture market of which companies are thinking about and looking at 21 pricing versus what we call 22 pricing, and there's going to be an adjustment. And I think that the best companies 
are going to be able to fight through that adjustment. And a lot of companies are going to have to fight back to maybe 2018 pricing, which was still pretty decent. Well, speaking of adjustment, I think your Philadelphia Eagles and guys, New York Giants are going to need some adjustments here because those records that you guys ended up with was just boring. I don't know what else to say. Eagles in the playoffs for the last five years. Yeah, he's right. The Eagles have been in the playoffs. And since you went down this road, I'll go down this road as well. The people the Giants brought in are the right people. And I'm telling you right now, Daniel Jones is the real deal. They're not moving on for him. They're not trading for Russell Wilson. And you're going to see two offensive linemen taken in the first seven picks of the draft. At five, Evan Neal from the University of Alabama to the Giants. And at seven, Tyler Linderbaum, center, University of Iowa. The first time a center has gone that high. Back to you. Full Gettleman picks there. Strength on the lines. Save it for the fan. Your boy Spike, who trusts the process. He's waiting to hear you call in, Guy, at any point. All right, Guy Dami from On the Tape. Thank you very much for joining Rick, myself, and the OK Computer audience to make some sense of what's going on in the tech market here. When we come back, Rick and I are going to be joined by Mikel Jolet, the front man of the Airborne Toxic event. And we're going to talk about this little Joe Rogan Spotify brouhaha. So stick around. Hey, Dan. What up, guy? You're into this fintech. What's all this I'm hearing about current? You're going to like this guy. Current is a fintech company that's completely disrupting traditional banking. Wait a second. Does that mean I don't have to drive to the bank anymore? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I'm a new current customer and I manage all of my finances from one easy to use app. Well, I got to get this app, but where can I learn more? It's super easy. Just go to current.com slash OK, O-K-A-Y and download the app. That's current.com slash OK. Current is a financial technology company, not a bank. Banking services provided by and Visa debit card issued by Choice Financial Group, member FDIC, pursuant to a license from Visa USA Inc. and can be used everywhere Visa debit cards are accepted. Hey, it's Dan here. I'm excited to tell you about a $1 billion app that's disrupting the way people like you and me invest. It's called Masterworks. They offer investors access to an estimated $1.7 trillion alternative asset that was once only accessible by the ultra-wealthy. I'm talking about blue chip art. Blue chip art has seen price appreciation that's outpaced the S&P 500 by 164% from 1995 to 2021. And the Wall Street Journal recently called it among the hottest markets on earth. It's no wonder the ultra rich like Jeff Bezos recently sold tons of Amazon stock and bought more art. And now you can too with the art investment app called masterworks.io. Join over 300,000 members for free on masterworks.io. Just go to masterworks.art slash okcomputer, O-K-A-Y. That's masterworks.art slash okcomputer. See important disclosures at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. All right, I'm back with my co-host Rick Heitzman. We're joined by Mikel Jole, a new friend of mine over the last year. He is the indomitable frontman of the rock band, the Airborne Toxic Event. He is also pretty prolific on the Twitter. That's kind of where we met. That's where everyone meets these days. Isn't that the case? He is a New York Times bestselling author of Hollywood Park. It's a memoir about his life. It also was accompanied by an album that came out in 2020 by the same name. It's a great album. So go get the book. Get the album. Mikkel, welcome to OK Computer. You have been on On The Tape, but this is your first time on OK Computer. This is my first appearance on OK Computer. This is this is weird. This is wild. It's the computers are OK, I guess. No, come on. Yeah, it's all good. Come on. Thank I mean, you listen, for having me. It's nice I to actually, be here. I actually pitched the name to you, didn't I, this you past did. summer you a did. little bit? And I, and I was very much for it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. everyone's been – Rick, you were very um, positive on it right out of the gate. I mean uh, – I like the name. I've got a lot of a lot of positive feedback on the name. People want to uh, lean it was into better the name. Than, they like the double meaning. It was meaning. better than Pablo Money or Kid, <laughs> Kid B. Uh, Pablo Money. That would have been awesome, dude. <laughs> Seriously. So, so you know, part of the idea was – make Brado like, head jokes all day. I yeah. know. But when I, yeah. when I first heard – Um, OK Computer by Radiohead when it came out in 1997. It's like this big departure for them. You were, uh, you know, you were into music back then. Were you a music critic back then, Mikkel? I mean, it was kind of like, it was like a big departure from what they were doing, and they became like this kind of techno band. And to me, it felt like the last 20 years, you know, it felt like it was the soundtrack for uh, Black Mirror before Black Mirror was ever written, you know? (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. I thought that record just, uh, it played around with electronic music. It was almost like Aphex Twin with a backbeat or something. At least Kid A got to that. I think OK Computer just, it was still a rock and roll record, but it started to sort of really play with soundscapes in a way that was really interesting. 
the great thing about Radiohead is that they're just so good. They're so good. Tom York can sing so well and they can all flat play so well that they took like the idea of being a rock band to like as far as you can. And then it was like, all right, well, we have to find something new to do because we just we've got all this handled. Yeah, they handled it pretty early, too. Yeah. Right. Oh, they're so they're so great. God. Yeah. Well, listen, we wanted to get you here because Rick as a VC is invested in like big media or tech platforms or the sort of platforms that are disintermediating old media. And you as an artist who like I know that you and I've talked a lot over the last year or so. And the first time you came on on the tape, you know, a year ago, I saw you tweeting about how the music business was broken. And, you know, we go on and we're going to talk about this a bit more later. But, you know, you had a lot of thoughts with like without the ability to tour and really with all these disintermediaries between you and your family. Fans, it became a really difficult way for a lot of musicians or artists in general to kind of make a living. And so now it's kind of interesting, you know, with what's going on with the situation with Spotify, I'm kind of of two minds in this whole situation. I'm not like a Joe Rogan fan. I don't listen to him, so I don't really have strong opinions. I see the headlines. But then when I see all the criticisms that were leveled at him, and then you heard his apology, which I think is really interesting. It's probably something that doesn't play so well with his hardcore fans. It was kind of interesting watching this play out on Twitter. There were people saying that, oh, it's censorship. This You got into it, Mikkel, with one of the Winkle V on Twitter because he was <laughs> screaming about censorship. What, what was your take on that first is just kind of somebody who thinks about these things, not as much as an artist. I just thought that, that particular, he was comparing Neil Young to the oppression of the Soviet regime. And I just thought, let's get a little perspective. Twitter, people get a little overheated. It's like I always tell people, if you're comparing something to Nazis, you're wrong. Only the Nazis were Nazis. Trump's not a Nazi. Trump is Trump. Whoever you disagree with about Medicare isn't a Nazi. They're just someone you disagree with. Like, let's leave Nazis as a special case. And I guess you could say with the authoritarian regimes of Soviet Union, he, he compared Neil Young. I think it was something like rocking in the free world unless someone doesn't agree with your views and then it, you're going to try and bully them like you're the Soviet Union. I was like, slow down, my friend. Let's just take a breather. He's this individual, not a government. This is him actually exercising his own free speech and also just free market capitalism. He told Spotify, you have a choice. Spotify said, we're going with Joe. He said, cool, pull my IP off. And, he, and they did. I don't see what the problem is. I feel like the market worked. He did exactly what he wanted. I mean, we can have our attitudes about it, but no sort of censorship went on and nothing, no kind of oppression went on. It just people disagreed. And that's how the market decided they were going to express that. I didn't see a problem. That's funny because it seemed like a big brouhaha last week. And this week it's kind of boiled over a little bit. And, and Rick, I'm just curious. I'm sure you saw this tweet thread from Kara Swisher. You know, she was responding to Spotify. CEO Daniel Eck, he put out a post on Sunday or a blog post. He said, we know we have a critical role to play in supporting creator expression while balancing it with the safety of our users. In that role, it is important to me that we don't take the position of being a censor, a content censor. And Kara's point, and she's made this point for years as it relates to Facebook and all these other platforms, it's like they do that when it's convenient, you know what I mean, for them, and they don't really want to be viewed as a media company. But this company spent $100 million to guarantee his exclusive content. So I'm thinking for, for you as somebody who invests in these platforms, how do you think about this? Yeah, I think about more like Mikel that you have to be able, everybody has to be able to vote. Everybody has their freedom. Joe Rogan should be able to say what he wants. And Neil Young or Mikel or anyone could do what they want. If you, I don't want you to sell my product because you're selling product that I disagree with. Or someone could cut their fees to say, I really want to be next to Joe Rogan because I'm anti-vax also. Whatever those opinions are, let everybody figure it out. And it doesn't mean they're Nazis. It just means that people have a difference of opinion and folks can line up behind wh who they agree with. Also, I think there's a space to be made for bad actors versus people who just like Joe Rogan's not a bad actor. He's just not. I, I, and, and I know that's not a popular opinion in my sort of political circles. I think people want to just find a big target and aim it. But I mean, if you watched what he said in his apology or I don't even know if it was an apology video, it was just a very sensible response. He's wrong. He is wrong. And he was wrong to have uh, what's the guy's name that he had on initially that was sort of the anti-vaxxer spreading propaganda. That guy shouldn't have been on the show. So he made a mistake booking that guy. But, you know, it's not like Joe Rogan's out here like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to try and screw this up. And I think the reason we're having these discussions is we're still sort of figuring out what these platforms are. Are they like newspapers? Are they like companies? They're, they're obviously new media. What's their responsibility? What's the artist's responsibility, the creator's responsibility? What's the fans and listeners' responsibility? And I don't think the answers are as simple as, let's say, Twitter wants them to make them out to be.
I think you're right. And everybody makes mistakes. And I think there has to be room for apologies. There has to be room for second choices. And, you know, a lot of people publish a lot of things. And therefore, the more you publish, the more you're going to get some things wrong. So there has to be room for the apology. There has to be room to come back together and say, hey, let me clarify what I said. That's not what I really meant. I'm not anti-vaxxer. You know, I might have made a mistake on booking. I might have made a mistake or come off in a short clip differently than I would if you listen to the whole show. So there has to be space for it. But I think, Dan, going back to your point on Kara, there's an in-between phase. And and Facebook kind of lived in that saying, hey, I don't control what people post. I got this machine who just sorts out what Dan wants to see. And if Dan wants to see vax or anti-vax, I can't look at every picture. I can't look at every word or character that goes through. The machine just shows you what you want to see. So what responsibility do they have there? And that's been a large part of the problem in Silicon Valley, especially in a world where no group of humans could filter the amount of content that's been uploaded in user-generated media over the last 20 years. And I think that there's some responsibility, and it's very clear, there's responsibility against hate, there's responsibility against racism and, and most isms there, and they've done a pretty good job of filtering that out. Uh, but then I think there's a second level of responsibility in that they are not just a distribution measure of content, but they're a sponsor of content and they're kind of a key financer of content in the in the position of Joe Rogan. This wasn't just a, a long tail artist who uploaded something on their platform that they were just distributing out to their subscriber base. They knew him. They pay, they're paying him nine figures to publish on the base. It's an implied endorsement of what he's saying. And I think you can't hide behind, hey, big open platform. At that point, the people, when you're producing original content, you're putting your name next to them. And whether that's Joe Rogan or Philip Morris or anti-vaxxers, you're, you're becoming an affiliate. And that's where you have to think about you are the company you keep. And that's the reputation that you have to take with you. But then you have to consider, just to push back a little bit on that, Rick, is they have Charlie Kirk, they have Ben Shapiro, they have Rush Limbaugh for crying out loud or had Rush Limbaugh. Like at why Joe Rogan particularly, and I get they make money from Joe Rogan because they have a sponsorship, but they make money from these other right wing, let's say anti-information <laughs> spreaders, uh, incorrect, <laughs> misin- for spreaders of misinformation, which yes. I think is dangerous and I think is wrong. And I want to be very clear, like I, I think the anti-vaxxers are dangerous and they're spreading propaganda and they shouldn't be doing that. At the same time as you have to wonder, okay, so why Joe Rogan? You've got much bigger problems than Joe Rogan in the media sphere. And then secondly, okay, so that's Spotify. What about YouTube? So how about we then have every artist on YouTube pull their stuff off of YouTube because there's people on YouTube that YouTube hasn't stopped spreading misinformation. Same thing with Facebook. My third question, why the fuck is it the artist's responsibility? If you want to boycott Spotify as a consumer, boycott Spotify. Why is everybody like, I know the solution. How about if artists don't make money? That seems to be the solution for everything. Yeah. Hey, Mikel, just from an artist standpoint, and you and I were talking about this yesterday when I saw you in LA, does it put you in a bad spot here? Some of your absolute idols as you know like Bruce Springsteen and Joni Mitchell and, and Neil Young and you're you know you're an artist and you have music coming out and you're going on tour and you know these are things that maybe you just don't want to be involved in but do you feel any pressure to be involved in them you know like what if this thing went on for a while you know what I mean it had a pretty quick resumption I'm just curious no I think it's important that any of us in the public eye use whatever power we have to stand up for propaganda not being spread that's going to kill people. I, I feel pretty strongly about that. I think that's that's a reasonable a reasonable thing. Did you think about that? Did you think? Did you talk to your manager? Did you, t- did you talk to the people close to you about? Hey, if maybe I shouldn't be on certain platforms. No, I don't feel the same way about it as these other artists. I think that particularly with this Joe Rogan issue, I I just think like <laughs> Joe is like fine. I mean, he's he's kind of like a stony guy. He's actually funny. It's hard to be funny. So part of me is just an artist who respects people who are talented. He's talented. He's funny. And I don't agree with him on a lot of things, obviously, but I don't think he's a bad actor. I don't listen to it much. I've listened to a few podcasts, but he's like 50th, maybe 100th, 500th on a list that I would start much higher. And you want to <laughs> like, let's boycott a bunch of other shit over a bunch of other people. So this is not the we're career like, hill that you're going to die on it's here. It's Joe Rogan, dude. <laughs> yeah. He's just like, he's like your older brother that smokes a lot of weed with his buddies and <laughs> did a lot of karate and he hangs out and he's like, yeah, man, my friend, my friend fucking saw Bigfoot, bro. He saw him. You don't know. No, check it out. No, they won't tell you this on the news, but he saw Bigfoot. And like, 
And you're by the time you leave after three hours with that guy, you're like, oh, yeah, I bet he did. They fucking saw Bigfoot. I think he saw Bigfoot. <laughs> and in these instances, and it's kind of innocuous in a lot of context, but I think in this instance, it's a little dangerous. And he fucked up. He knows he fucked up. And I think he's going to be a lot more careful. And people let him know. And I think that he was sensitive to it. If you saw what he said, I think he was like, whoa, where did I step in here? And what he stepped in was, motherfucker, 10 million people are dead. Like, do not book people like this to come and spread this horse shit. And I don't agree with a lot of the guests that he books. But then he had Bernie on, you know, I think he had, like you said, Matty Iglesias on. It's not like he's like a bad actor trying to push a point of view. I, I think he should be more selective. And he's not a journalist, but he's the first one. He'll be like, yeah, I'm not a journalist. I'm just a dude talking. But the system worked then, right? The system worked. He had someone on. He got feedback. He said, oh, given that feedback, I made a mistake. I'll be more thoughtful going forward. I think this is the beginning of the platforms being called out by creators. And we're moving to a world where creators have more power. In the creator economy, the creators are going to have more power as there's less gatekeepers out there with whether they be music labels or whatever it is. So you're, there's going to be with more power becomes more accountability. So I, I hopefully more artists and creators are going to to be able to voice their opinion and that's going to count in the eyes of not only the platforms but also their customers and that people are going to be able to vote with their attention dollars and with their attention and their dollars and i think that's going to be something that hopefully in the medium term we'll be able to create some uh, rules of the road for both the platforms the creators and any uh, any other go between yeah i i agree I, I think that's really well said i i think that the big change that's happening with web3 is going to start with just a stronger relationship between creators and their audiences. And that's going to be happening, I think, in a big way in music in the next couple of years. There's a huge, I think, important business model and a lot of money on the table and a lot of engagement that could be happening that isn't happening. That empowers artists, which is good. That empowers fans, which is good. That's a change that's really coming. And as we navigate what that's going to mean in terms of these people that have this new power, I think we're going to get into a lot of these sorts of discussions because we're in this emerging media environment where you know, newspapers are and platforms and media companies are all kind of wearing different hats. And then you've got, you know, companies that are essentially wearing hats of in traditional media didn't even exist before. So I think that um, it, it's a fascinating world. That, and But I really want to emphasize, I think it's important that we have a distinction between what is a left right and what is just, you know, propaganda, misinformation that's dangerous. Um, and I fully agree with Rick on that. Well, listen, that's what we call in the business a great segue here. When we come back, Mikel is going to join Jared Dicker from the Churning Group and Sally Shin from United Masters. And we're going to talk about how music is navigating this kind of intersection between Web 2 and Web 3. So, Rick, it was great chatting with you today. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Great seeing you guys. Taboola uses AI to power recommendations for many of the world's top publishers and cell phone manufacturers. You know Taboola if you ever went to websites like CNBC or USA Today. When you finish reading an article, it's that tricked out recommendation engine pointing you towards additional content you will like. They also help brands reach over 500 million daily users, which makes them a compelling alternative to Facebook and Google ad platforms. Taboola has long-term exclusive partnerships with publishers, which means they help people like you and me discover content outside of social media. Taboola is a founder-led company that is traded as TBLA on the NASDAQ. Find out more about their mission at taboola.com. And we are back with Mikel Jolet, the frontman extraordinaire of the rock band Airborne Toxic Event. And joining us are OK Computer contributors Jared Dicker of the Cherna Group and Sally Shin from United Masters. This podcast is kind of a culmination of like a year of some people getting to know each other. Sally and I have known each other for a long time. She was at NBC, I want to say, for maybe a decade. And she joined United Masters because she really believed in their mission and what they're doing with artists and connecting with fans. And, and just some of the kind of dynamics that are playing out is this intersection between Web 2 and Web 3. And Jared and I met last year. And we actually met because of Mikkel, believe it or not, as I was networking in New York about people who were interested in some of these same things we we're talking about with Sally. Our good friend, uh, my good friend, Joe Marchese, introduced me to Jared, and I introduced him to you, Mikkel. And, and the, let's go back a little further. Sally introduced Mikkel to NBC's audience when she was there. He did an op-ed, I think it was in early March of 2021, about this kind of friction between artists and their ability to kind of monetize their work with their fans because of all of these intermediaries. And really, the point was, like, how are NFTs going to affect that? So here we 
are, Mikkel. We're a year later, and, and you and I met on Twitter because you were just kind of threading about what the pandemic did to the business of music and without touring and what that means. And so here we are, like almost a year later. What, what have you learned? I mean, because it, there were fits and starts as it relates to the you know touring coming back, and some people were able to do it and others were not. So I spent a lot of time talking to everybody, experts, I spent about nine months, um, you were on most of those calls, talking to people who had run Ticketmaster, people who had who had big Web3 ideas that were sort of thought leaders, people who re- were in the um, auction space, uh, thinking a lot about NFTs, music, music companies. And I sort of, I've come full circle, I think, with it, where, you know, it started off with like, artists don't make enough money. And then here, here's all these like magic internet solutions. And then I'm, a year later, like, artists don't make enough money. I, I'm just kind of back to square one. I, I don't. I don't think social tokens are going to work. I don't think NFTs are going to work in the way that they're working now, which is basically mirroring the fine art industry. And they're talking about early media adoption. It's really and speculations where they're getting their value. I don't think fans are interested in having a financial relationship with artists. I think it's just everyone's trying to find some fancy way to get to the point of paying artists more. And maybe we should just pay artists more. It's so true. I've been toggling with this for quite some time. And it's really hard for me objectively to get outside of just my ultra fandom, my like 200 fish shows, my dead tours, my like constant infatuation with everything music and do is spend more money on my bands. I've never (laughs) once thought about taking out of the pockets of the artists. So like sometimes I just run into this just confusing cyclone of being like, look, like I am totally bought in on giving more value to fans giving more opportunity to artists, but fish paying me money to go see their show is definitely not anything that I've ever thought about or am the least bit interested in. No, I think that's totally right. And I think that's part of where the sort of the shiny new object of NFTs, I think, by the way, NFTs are the future and we won't call them NFTs. It was like early on, it was called the information superhighway or something (laughs) with the internet. But, you know, all, all we're talking about is digital ownership and digital ownership is important and it's necessary. You can't have culture without ownership. And that's the way that we're going to build permanent culture and ownership online is through NFTs. So it's not that I don't think they're important. I think this idea of it's this sort of panacea for the the big problem relating to the industry, which is, I mean, there's two big problems. One, three major corporations control all the profits or let's say 90% of the profits. And two, basically the reason artists don't make any money is because it's too easy to pirate music. You know, it was always like Napster came along and it made it very easy to steal music. And then even when they shut down Napster, you had BitTorrent and you had... What was LimeWire? You had all these other sort of services that came up. And so the iTunes model was, hey, spend a dollar on a song. And it was kind of like a compromise. I was like, all right, fine. I won't fucking, can I swear on this podcast? Yeah, I won't fucking like want. steal your song, bro, but I'll, I'll pay you a buck. Fine. Fuck you. And then Spotify came along and was like, hey, what if you had all music forever of all that was ever made for 10 bucks a month? And I feel like everyone in the world was like, word? Yeah. Okay. That sounds great. And then artists were like, fucking what? And then it just decimated profits. So I think the real issue is how about we pay artists more and how about people own the music because it's intellectual property. What we have now is basically like if you took all of fine art and you unlocked the museums and then said, oh, fine art's just not worth anything because it's really easy to steal. That's all that's happened in the music industry in the last 20 years. And I think it's kind of bullshit. Yeah, and I also just said the relationship between artists and their music is definitely shifting, as you guys were saying, from label to just being able to grow your own community. Our audience and our artists are merging artists, so we really like to optimize on the thousand true fans, the same sort of concept in startups. We think about our artists as the CEOs of their enterprise. So how do we create a business? How do we help them grow market and also monetize in different ways beyond streaming? We all know that streaming alone, you can't have a fulfilling career unless you are the top 0.001% or you're the Drakes of the world. And I think when we think about the shift into Web3 or the the world that a lot of the music companies are talking about, there's definitely a lot of noise in the industry, like you guys are also saying. Like a lot of people are trying to figure out what NFTs are. I think what is really interesting for us is again going back to finding your community, your fans. And so building out that close connection between artists and fans directly. 
And so we are dabbling like everyone else and we're in that learning experience to figure out how to build that community so that the artists can have that direct relationship. So everything from communicating with people on Discord all the way to being able to release your songs to your truest of fans and building that closeness and giving them access to different tickets or access. I think that's sort of like a really important aspect of our artists and the emerging artists. And there are more and more growing number of artists that are going into music just because the barrier to entry has gotten so much lower and you don't need the three majors anymore to become a successful career. So So how do you, though, crack this nut where streaming is kind of this discovery mechanism? It's actually, you know, something that I think probably young artists are grow up in the business and all the people who are trying to get access to them or that they're convincing them that you need the biggest audience that you can on the biggest platforms you can. But like some of the data that we've seen is like 90 percent of all streaming income goes to like a couple percent or so of the top artists. So if that's just not a way forward, why is it? It's great to talk about community and building that community, a thousand true fans, but there really needs to be some sort of economic relationship. And you were, you know, Mikkel, you were just saying it's kind of dicey, but like our tokenomics, are, are they this thing that in some way, shape or form may make a lot of sense? There has to be some Web3 layer to this if we're going to kind of disintermediate these massive platforms. I think NFTs are, in, in the way that we understand them now, are, are a solution looking for a problem. I think it's really just a question of charging more. You know, I think if you literally had a prorated rate of streaming that went to artists based on actual listenership, that would solve the problem if it was higher. So if I listen to a thousand fish songs, Jared, in a month, I want fish to get all my money. Right now, if I'm on Spotify, I listen to a thousand fish songs, fish doesn't get my money. I want fish to get my money. Furthermore, fish should make more money per stream. I think that's one set of problems we can solve tomorrow. And it's a very obvious one, and no one's talking about it because no one has thought about how do we address these very sort of brick-and-mortar questions of artists should be making more, and everyone doesn't want to address it because they like to maybe they like to a $10 a month Spotify subscription. I think artists maybe just don't understand, too, how, how, how they're just getting like these sort of crumbs. I would add one more thing, and that is that there's this sort of pageantry model to the industry. Like, you've made it. There's like the classic, it's almost like a movie of the week idea of a band breaking that's like, all right, kid, you got your record deal. And they're like, ah, I no longer have to be a responsible fucking human. I'm just a rock star now. And that idea is sort of anathema to build a business, maintain an email list, think about how you're going to interact with your fans and build a community outside of just streaming. So there's all these questions of community and ownership and building that I think are great. And the people in Web3 are asking those questions and trying to find solutions. And I think all of that's in the right place. But there's a very obvious thing, which is, how about we pay them more and we pay them according to the fans that listen to them? Well, all right, you just set me up here because the record company, Rosie, just gave me a big advance. Jared, you're sitting over there in the jurors, you know, just, you know, just this is a little one on one thing, you know. Mikel has a very complicated relationship with Bruce Springsteen a little bit. Is that too personal or no? I mean, no, that's okay. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Okay. I've heard you say it. I, you it's know, fine. Loud, but I, so I, I don't mean to like just jam that right in your face. But but you are a huge Springsteen fan, Jared. You're looking to deploy capital, though, in a way to kind of disintermediate these big platforms. I just don't think the big platforms are ever going to raise their prices allowing them to give more money to the artists that they're streaming. I'm just curious, are there some models out there that are great alternatives? And and obviously, Sally, with what you guys are doing in United Masters for emerging artists, but is there anything for existing artists that would work if you want to try to pay them more per stream? I'm way less, I'd say. I'm way less excited about trying to like retrofit and leverage Web3 for like skeuomorphic trends, like to rethink streaming and royalties, because I think There's a lot of headwinds, a lot of resistance. A lot of great companies have been thinking about that, like what Sally and and crew are doing. And I think like I like to take a more outside in approach to ask the questions and provide the answers to like where we want to go. So one is like Spotify and streaming in general. I'm not old, but I'm not young, (laughs) I'd say. But I remember going to Coconuts, Jack's Records in Red Bank or Princeton Record Exchange and that's where you found music and you would go because you heard a single on the radio and I'd have to beg my mom to let me buy the whole CD and I'd have to promise her that I'd listen to every song. But when you went to those stores, it was really like up to the record store and the relationship with the label as to what's going to be put on the shelves and what's going to be on the end cap and what's being promoted. And now we live in a world where all of this shit is discoverable. So like I could go to Spotify 
and find all of these new artists or go to YouTube and find new artists. And many don't remember that you used to maybe find like 300 if you went to like a record store, even in the CD era. And now you could effectively have everything at your fingertips. So one thing I think is like an interesting argument, which I won't take a side on right now, is if you don't exist on Spotify, do you exist? Or on Apple Music, do you exist? And can you be discoverable? And should artists in the relationship with fans be thinking about that more as like top of funnel? Like, hey, this is a way where it's less about us being able to capitalize on per stream, or maybe if we can make more money, let's focus on making more money there. But it really is kind of a, a benefit of discovery. And then how does that start to trickle down? So the things that I'm personally like really interested about in the Web3 space is really the fan side. It's like, what are things that I could be doing in crypto, leveraging NFTs or you know other sorts of protocols that are going to give me new value that I wasn't able to get prior? A lot of it is experimentation right now. Like, I don't think there's anything that is the solve all, but like one company that we invested in, Doomsday X, quite simply, and why I love them is they're turning fans into producers. So there's this artist, Halik Mall. He's pretty well known in the crypto music scene. He's creating this new music video that's going to be owned and driven by the fans. He did an NFT drop. The fans own the producer NFTs. They get to see behind the scenes. They get to make some decisioning. We'll see. But at the end, you know, they're producers. So when Halik Mal launches this music video, Jared Dicker gets a producer credit and gets to be a part of it. So me as a fan, I get to do something new. And I think what's interesting, I think, for like this discussion too, because I don't think Web3 retrofit fixes everything. And me being a music fan drove a lot of friction for me getting there and drove my opinion in this space. But I do think it's also interesting. I'm curious, Mikhail's point of view here. I think we're thinking of Web3 as a product or monetization method for the music industry. And I'm curious now that it opens up these new things and new ways of thinking, is it in fact more of a new genre? Is it less like, hey, here's a new way for artists to make money and more like, is this new ways for people to evolve their current craft? Or is it actually going to create an entirely new genre of artists that understand this space, understand the software, understand the relationship, and it kind of crafts a unique new subculture or genre of music that we don't have? I think a lot of people think of Web3 and then they just revert back to, hey, you know, what NFTs are you selling? And it's more of an idea and a movement around things are structured, not some people say, you know, this is a digital merchandise or something like that. I think that's like one piece of it. I do also think that Web3 is not going to solve the streaming issues. When you think about the Web2 platforms like Spotify and Apple Music and other DSPs, the economics are already there. There are companies that are doing really interesting things in space with IP ownership, like Royal. I know they did a big drop recently with Nas. There's companies like Audius and they are doing a lot of interesting things that are giving more power to the artist by getting the financial advances or getting some of the economics that are closer to the artists and to the fans rather than to the labels. And the key part really is the fact that they have their master rights and they're able to keep those rights that give them more power to grow and build their incentives that way. I feel like all these things, the heart's in the right place, but they're just not understanding the basics of the industry. And I, every time I talk to Web3 people, I think they really love music and they really want to be involved with music, but they don't spend a lot of time with musicians. And like, how do you make your income every year? Well, what I do is I get publishing checks for residuals or for new songs, or if I place a sync, I got touring income and I have some streaming income, depending on what kind of artist I am. But I think the very simple question of why aren't we paid more for our music is just brushed aside. And I don't understand it. I don't understand being able to imagine a whole new monetization method where you're going to say like, OK, what can Web3 do for music? I don't know. What did the Internet do for what did the telephone do for jazz? What did Morse code do for the madrigal? Like, I don't it, it's an it's an art form. And this idea that we're going to suddenly become something else. We make music. People like our music. They listen to our music because they relate to it emotionally and they like to hear it. And I think what's happening is you have artists who are early adopters, and I'm sure there were early adopters of vinyl records, for example, who got really into vinyl records, but it didn't change music. It was just a new medium. That's all that's happening now. It's new media. But the artist, it's a song, it's a story, it's a melody, it's a perspective. That's not going to change. And, and I feel like the very simple question of, 
that everyone I think should be trying to answer is how about we stop ripping off artists? And I think Audius, by the way, you mentioned Audius, I think is that's a great example of something that could be the future. And I think it's a really solid Web3. You're paid instantly. It's on the blockchain. You're, I think it's a penny a stream, and it does go specifically to the artist that you're listening to. I think all these other things are very well-intentioned models for monetizing fandom. And I've been working on this for a year, and I'm going to be launching something soon. And people ask me, you know, what's your comp? Is it is that Spotify? What's the new, is it NFTs? Is it, are you going to blockchain this and do that? And what, are you going to do a token drop? And I'm like, my model is fish. My model is <laughs> Dave Matthews Band and Pearl Jam and U2. My model is people who've built strong culture. But really, and, and I think that's what we, I think there's a huge revenue stream ready to be captured there. But, but, and I will just put this caveat here, not my model, not anyone else's model is set on solving the basic question of why is everyone okay with ripping off artists? Why do we just skip past that part where it's like, well, yeah, we can't pay you more. Why not? It's worth more. People used to pay a lot more. People pay about a, a third for music, what they used to pay 20 years ago. If you include inflation, you count for inflation. And I just don't understand the perspective. It's like if you walked into a room with a bunch of lawyers and said, you know what? You're just going to make less per hour now. Why? Oh, because it's really easy to pirate your legal perspective on things. It seems like that's a problem that needs to be solved. The other things I think are right, which is build community. You know, I really like, you know, Greg Eisenberg's perspective on all this stuff. And he's, he's got, and there's a few other people, Dixon's perspective is really good, who are talking about, and Jared, you talk about this stuff a lot. I think all that stuff's right on. Build a community, connect with your fans, take the fans that want to participate in your community the most and figure out a smart way to monetize and give them the feeling of, you know, connectedness. I'd, I would not include ownership. I don't think fans want to own music. I think that's just people playing around with new media. Yeah, and I love that take too, because I think a lot of the earlier approaches, especially that are facing the headwinds of like streaming and royalties are like one artist, like fans, fans want ownership songs. So they should get a certain percentage of those royalties. If you talk to any artist, you know, they'll tell you one, they'd be pretty embarrassed to have their top fans get penny checks every month and really learn kind of what they're making off these streams. The second is you're effectively cutting more out of the artist upside. I think that's one huge conflicting component that's happening in this space right now, which is sure, like there's a ton of value in community. The fan artist relationship could be stronger, but when you make it about ownership, you're putting the bag on the fans. So you're basically saying fans should pay more. You should compensate for maybe the label cut or the Spotify cut or the other places that are cutting and not giving more to the artists. Fans are like, yeah, that sounds great when it's a, $30,000 NFT, but that's not fandom. People who are buying those music NFTs, which is definitely a group and I'm not shitting on it by any means. I'm excited by it, but they're collectors. They're like crypto people. You know, you're not building audience development and fandom through an NFT right. one to one. It's just, it's just the antithesis of that. It's emerging media. So it's like when the first final record came out, it was very valuable. It didn't matter if it was Joey Bird and the Bird Tags or what, whatever the name of the doo-wop band it was. It, you know, like, it was like, cool, a vinyl record actually much precedes doo-wop. But, and that's what's happening. If emerging media, you, you know, Board Ape, Yacht Club, that's like the first, well, one of the three, let's say, of the first big NFT communities uh, that have gained value. So you want to own an ape. That's like, I, I get that. But 10 years from now, is that the thing, this sort of fine art model of speculation on fine art because it's an emerging model? No. And it's a, the way to monetize music. No, I don't want a financial relationship with the war on drugs. I love the war on drugs. I want the new shit first. I want to get into the show and I want to be closer to the band. And maybe it'd be cool to meet some other fans that think that way too. So Jared, you you tweeted about proof of attendance protocol, a PO app the other day. Aren't there lots of the things that we're just talking about here, whether it relates to ticketing, whether it relates to being in attendance of something, you know what I mean, and then getting a real world item. We might be in the first pitch of the first inning is, is what I'm saying. And so I think what, Jared, you're trying to say is you want to be really open-minded about this because there's going to be certain aspects of this that work really well for artists, I have to assume, because we're going in this direction. And whether it be like, you know, secondary ticketing or, I mean, there's, there's so many things, right? Or no? You don't need the blockchain for that. You could use Venmo. 
It's what I say. It's a solution looking for a problem. Let's get a bunch of people together and we can put it on the blockchain and do use Ethereum right. and then pay the right. gas fee. I could fucking vend right, But hold on, hold on. But what record. about you just said Board Ape Yacht Club? And Jared, I'd love to get your take on this because this is really important. That didn't exist a year ago. And then in April of 2021, it existed and there were 10,000 of them and you could have minted them for like a buck or something like that, right? Okay. And then all of a sudden you had this community all of a sudden, 10,000 of them. And then you had tens of other thousands who wanted to be a part of it. And then when they all get on Clubhouse or Twitter Spaces, and then there's thousands of other people joining, I mean, that is at the root, I think, of what is going to happen to a lot of different arts. Whether the floor price is going to remain 100 ETH for those, depending upon where ETH is, and you know that could be a quarter of a million dollars. I don't know. I'd probably take the under on that. But that community building, and you said culture. Oh, my goodness. If you were going to take a list, you're going to like figure out the, the most like influential cultural sort of things that have gone on in the last year, Board Ape Yacht Club is clearly one of them. Right. But that's emerging media speculation in fine art. That's what that is. It's fine art speculation in emerging media. That is not the solution to a very populist question, which is how do we pay 100,000 artists more fairly? That's that's the question, the populist question that we're trying to answer. How do artists not get ripped off by corporations? And how do we not also then weigh them down with this extra layer of Web3 stuff that they don't really need? Yeah. They, you don't need Web3 to do any of these things that we're talking about, except for a creator coin, which I think is a really bad idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think whenever Web3 gets in the conversation of Web3 versus Web2, or what could be done on Web3 versus done on a broader spectrum, Web3 enthusiasts get very stuck because I think it is a very particular thing that is valuable and unique, but it is kind of focused on the financialization of assets and attributing value to things that are scarce. And right. in the Board Ape example, right, that was the case. They had 10,000 of these apes released. What was really fascinating about what they did was that they gave all commercial rights to the ape buyers. So anyone who purchased this individual asset had full free commercial reign to build any IP off of that and monetize it as they'd wish. The best example is, I'd say, like Jenkins, the valet, who were these three people, because I think they're a non, I know who they are, so I'm not going to say their gender, but three people who created this whole story around this valet at the yacht club and everything that he was seeing. And it got so big to the point where they did their own NFT project. They were signed to CAA. They're doing a literary deal and writing a book with Neil Strauss. And it kind of blew up on its own. So I think that idea of like compounding IP is very interesting. In the music space, like I just think it's different. Like I think to Mikhail's point, it's like, I don't know. There's a few artists and musicians that I think are thinking about Web3. One is Mark Brownstein from the Disco Biscuits, who tweets about this very often and regularly. And he's someone that I've spoken to a lot about it. And his POV is around the fandom side, to Mikhail's point. Like, it really is less around, like, royalties and artists. And it's about, okay, yeah. can I build cool experiences for super fans? They have this NFT which is like a super Tisco biscuit pass. They call it like a Bisco pass or something. And if you have the NFT, it's provably serious. It's one-to-one. -one. You could log in and see like all the sound check live stream. So as a super fan, you get to see the behind the scenes. You get to see the rig. You get to be a part of it. Again, it's kind of experimenting, but I think it's also dangerous for Web3 enthusiasts to try to pit an if or or and rather just say, okay, here's some cool functions that can be done with Web3. And then as these things start to come about, you start to see and think like where they make sense and what genres and what industries. But I think like thinking of it as a replacement to the point I think Mikhail's making is like very dangerous because I don't think necessarily it is by any means at a point or broad enough to be able to assume all the responsibilities that are currently being done within the industry. This is the point I'm talking about where, where the Web3, we're just a solution looking for a problem, except for in a, few, in a few instances. Like I feel like most of the discussions I've seen around Web3, which I was very excited about when it first started, just kind of come down to a much more complicated way to do something that solves a problem that needs a different solution. I'm just curious, and just before we kind of get out of here, you know, if last year PFP NFTs kind of really became like the rallying cry with Web3 and, and no matter what industry you're looking at, what does 2022 bring for the music industry? What is the one thing that maybe has just kind of gotten uncovered? Again, it doesn't have to be blockchain related, but getting you more towards that kind of end game where artists are getting better compensated for their work. Gated fan communities, no question. It's just a very obvious revenue new stream that's just sitting out there 
And it's finding a manner and a permission and a culture which makes it very easy, efficient, and enjoyable to build for an artist to build a direct relationship with true fans. I think a thousand true fans is a very, both of you guys have alluded to that, and I, I think it's a very influential and important essay, and a lot of my ideas uh, around this space kind of come from that. And I think also just it's like if, if you're trying to build an onion stand, you talk to people who've been slinging onions for a long time, been slinging onions for 15 years. I would spend a bunch of time talking about this stuff, and I talked about it with my manager of all people who's just like been running our merch store and running our stuff, and I'm managed by Red Light, and he was like, yeah, those communities are really strong and they're strong because they build culture and they build culture in these ways. The next step is finding a strong permission culture basis for bands to build these gated communities because everything is discovery. That doesn't solve the streaming question, but just putting the streaming question aside, everything's discovery right now. You do the Facebook Live for free, you do the music thing for the radio for free, you come and you do the thing for the blog or the media outlet for free. Spotify's essentially free. It's a third of a cent per stream that you get 14% of if you're on a major and it comes a year and a half later, maybe. If you're on an indie, you get 50% of that third of a cent per stream a year and a half later. Everything's discovery. You're doing basically everything for free. And there, there, it used to be that you would hear the free thing on the radio for discovery and then someone buy your record for, and that's how you, that's how you made money. And so I think migrating towards gated and strong communities. And I think the ones that are the pioneers in this are actually just the bands and artists who have been doing this for a long time and have just built these great cultures. They exist out there and finding a way to take what's driving Dead & Co. and what's driving Fish and what's driving Dave Matthews and Pearl Jam and these bands that, uh, whether you're a fan of them or not, have built amazing cultures. Finding a way to democratize that idea, I think, is actually the solution. Having spent about a year trying to get NFTs to be the solution. I'm going to connect the dots between streaming and Mikhail's point, because I think we're focusing way too much on we need to solve for getting more value to artists and paying artists more. And we focus way too much on the streaming side. And if you look at average streaming fan versus the fan that's going to your show, this isn't like scientific evidence. I'm sure Mikhail has the numbers here, but I'm sure the fan that goes to the show is willing to pay 10x versus the person streaming the song. So we're constantly focused on like, squeezing money from streams but those aren't the super fans right the super fans are the ones that are following you on social that are tuning in that are going to the live shows and they're the ones that will spend more money it's kind of an inverse effect where especially in web3 like there's so much attention there to solve the problem but if you're focused on those fans you're not solving the problem you need to focus on those fans that are willing to open their wallet and spend time with you and like yes like that's something fish does great i spent ten dollars a month for live fish which gives me all of Fish's catalog whenever they play a show. The next day I can listen to it. You could actually pay $20 for better sound, which many people do. And I do that in addition to paying for YouTube Red and paying for Spotify because I love the fucking bands and I want to get more. So I'm not trying to make money off them. I'm not trying to squeeze. In right. fact, I'm paying exactly. more. And that's the audience. And I think to your point, like, it does put it does put emphasis and onus on the artist to lean in and do more. But this is another thing that drives me nuts. A lot of the narrative when it was about Web3 disruption in music was like, well, artists have to tour to make money. And that's so unfortunate. And it's like, it, ask any fan what they love most about music experience. And it's going to that show, right? And yep. it's like seeing friends and seeing live music. I haven't heard one artist ever say, oh, it sucks. I have to tour. I hate that. <laughs> right? It's like, where does this stuff come from? Right. And it is like putting, putting that energy there, I think is just right on. And I couldn't agree more. And I think it's amazing. We've gone so far and haven't done that yet. And I think you're right on that. That's the future. And maybe just to uh, add to it. So for, for our platform, streaming is obviously one revenue stream for the artists, but the other area that we focus a lot on is sync licensing, which we can go in another day. Um, there's a whole business in that category but our real focus for this year is really connecting that relationship with artists and fans, just we like we talked about with a thousand true fans and being able to capture those fans and their willingness to spend and actually invest in the artist careers, whether it be through you know live events or merchandise or any of these other product tools. That's going to be our big focus for us. It sounds like you've also sort of come around to this like, five to 10% of your fan base. So let's say of your touring fan base, let's say if you're worth 200,000 tickets, let's say for a small, then 20,000 people, 10 to 20,000 people 
do you, you both have that same sense that, that those, those are the people where there is a, a real need in the market and inefficiency in the market to capture revenue? Is that right? It's a lion's share of our users or we're really the emerging artists. So we don't have, you know, our artists aren't selling out multiple shows in, at SoFi Stadium. So there is a much bigger need and support to grow those. And that's why it's not about expanding the fan base to the widest number, and but it is really focused on those truest of loyal fans and, and being able to grow that through that avenue, I think. Yeah, that's just rock and roll ethics. You know, I remember somebody sitting me down when we first started to break it, and it was this manager, this famous red light manager, and he had a big glass and big teeth. He said, you kids need to calm the fuck down. Because we were all excited because <laughs> we had a song on the radio and we were blowing up locally and stuff. And he's like, you got to go earn your fans. You got to go play 500 shows. You got to shake a lot of hands. You got to put on great shows every night. You got to not be an asshole. And you got to put out more music. And he was like, do that. And you're going to have a career. And all of us were like, what? Who is this person? All right. Well, listen, on that note, I'm really excited to see what you're coming up with with the Airborne Talks event. I'm excited for you guys to get back on the road. And I'm excited for 2022 to get a bit more normal as it relates to just kind of what the fan is used to. But on the flip side of that, I really hope that artists are able to monetize better, no matter what tools they are using, whether they're just kind of walled garden-y, better Web 2 things, or there's going to be some iterations in Web 3 that really work. So, hey, Jared Dicker of the Churning Group, thank you very much for joining us today, OK Computer and Sally Shin of United Bastards. And then, of course, Mikel Jolay. Check out his book, Hollywood Park. It is a New York Times bestseller and obviously an album of the same name that came out in 2020 here. And uh, we hope to have you back, Mikel. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thanks once again to Current and Masterworks for sponsoring this episode of OK Computer. If you like what you heard, make sure you hit follow and leave us a review. It helps people find our show. And we want to hear from you. Email us at contact at risk reversal anytime. Follow and connect with us on Twitter at OK Computer Pod. We'll see you next time.